Welcome to Disunion, the Government Union Report, the podcast where we delve into the ever-evolving landscape of public sector labor policy and law. I'm your host, David R. Osborne, and I'm excited to be your guide through the complex world of government unionization. We bring in experts and individuals with hands-on experience navigating the challenges and opportunities surrounding the unionization of government employees. From the latest legal developments to the practical insights that shape the policies, we've got it covered. So get ready to gain a deeper understanding of the newsmaking issues that impact public sector labor policy across the nation. All right. Our guest today is Professor Michael Hartney. Uh, Professor Hartney is an associate professor at Boston College, a Hoover Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research and a research affiliate at Harvard University's Program on Education Policy and Governance. His book is called How Policies Make Interest Groups, Governments, Union, Unions, and the American Education. Uh, Professor Hartney, thank you for coming on the program. Thanks, David. It's great to be with you. All right. You asked me to call you Michael, so I'll, I'll abide by that. Um Michael, I wanted to cover a foundational concept before we go into into the substance of the book and into teachers unions specifically. You called teachers unions special interests or vested interests. What, what do you mean by those terms and, and how do they apply to teachers unions? It's a great question to lead off with. I think a lot of times – people equate teachers unions with rank and file teachers. And uh, while obviously teachers unions are composed of individual teachers, unions as organizations are uh, what political scientists would call special interests, meaning they're organizations, membership organizations in this case, that pursue the occupational interests of a group. Uh, But most of the time, I don't think uh, lay people tend to think of teachers unions that way. Um, They don't tend to think of them as on footing with other membership organizations like, say, the National Rifle Association or the AARP. And so uh, as a political scientist, I endeavor to treat teachers unions like I would treat any other interest group that you would study, which is a a group that comes together to try to influence uh, politics and then downstream from that policy. You also mentioned the terminology vested interests. And so Vested interests are what I would call a subcategory of special interests. Vested interests are typically even more powerful than special interests because vested interests uh, are groups that arise um, from a set of public policies or institutions. Uh, And in our case, that's the American education system. We have a public education system that spends anywhere from 700 to 800 billion dollars a year which means there are a lot of jobs, um, a lot of resources at stake. And so teachers unions naturally arise in that sense uh, as a vested interest. They arise to represent the occupational interests of folks who have a job in that $700 billion uh, government enterprise. Okay, got it. Well, so um, your your book documents how teachers unions became highly political organizations. Uh, so yes, special interests, yes, vested interests, but also highly political. Uh, and it wasn't all that always that way. Um, can you take us through the history of teachers unions and then sort of help us figure out how we got here today? Yeah, you know, it, one of the things that was remarkable to me at the outset of my research was I came across in the um, in the archives of the National Education Association, which um, uh, for listeners is the largest teachers union. It's actually the largest uh, um, public uh, sector union in all of North America. Um, and it's been around for a very long time, right? Uh, like over 150 years. Um, but it wasn't always a labor union like we think of today. Um, in fact, in the early um, periods uh, uh, prior to 1960, the NEA was really run by school administrators, so superintendents, uh, principals, and teachers were members, of course, but they really didn't steer the organization's uh, priorities. And, and what was remarkable to me was I came across uh, surveys that had been commissioned by the NEA in the 1950s that showed that other than voting, which was a, a behavior that teachers as highly educated citizens did with high frequency – Uh, Teachers themselves said they not only did they not participate in other forms of political activity, things like donating, knocking on doors, 
uh, trying to persuade their friends and neighbors or their fellow teachers who to support in an election. But they thought that teachers really shouldn't do those things. And that really struck me as remarkable, given that uh, certainly by the 1980s, political scientists who study interest groups across the American states had firmly settled on ranking teachers unions as the most powerful interest group in the nation's state capitals, uh, outflanking in many cases the business community, which is typically regarded in the United States as one of the most powerful interest groups. So this sort of set up this puzzle here of, well, how did it go to be the case that teacher organizations, which had not yet become teachers unions, were chock full of teachers who were certainly civic minded, but they weren't uh, deeply engaged in partisan political activity as they later became. Yeah, interesting. So what cha- what changed? It's, it's not only did the union change, but you're saying teacher individual teachers' behavior changed. You know how did how did that how did how did that evolve? Right. So the conventional wisdom was that, you know, teachers woke up one day and decided, well, we're massively underpaid. And so we're going to hit the picket lines and we're going to form these unions and off into the sun we go. And well, I don't think that I I do think there is some element of truth in that. Obviously, we saw a lot of uh, public sector strikes in the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, And it is fair to say that there certainly was a period of time where teachers were woefully underpaid. And if we go back far enough, you know, the unions still like to talk about the idea of a woman who would get pregnant and then be fired uh, from teaching. I mean, those stories are certainly true. They're quite old. Um, But I argue in the book that we can't uh, we can't um, take uh, as an article of faith that the reason that teachers unions become this super powerful interest group in American politics by the 1980s. Uh, as a product of them just like waking up one day and from the bottom up deciding to work really hard at it. My argument is that, you know, and and my argument here is that if that were the case, then any group of citizens that's interested in, say, uh, a healthier environment, cheaper health care, lower taxes could just wake up tomorrow and, you know, become an 800 pound gorilla uh, in in Washington, D.C. or in state capitals. And obviously that doesn't happen. So something had to have changed. Uh, And what I argue is that um, state governments actually became a partner um, with teachers unions and by passing public sector collective bargaining laws that had all sorts of effects on the relationship between school district employers and rank and file teachers and their unions, that these public sector collective bargaining laws Uh, actually reduced uh, the difficulty of mobilizing teachers to participate in politics. And that's really where things took off. It it was these public sector bargaining laws that that most of the time when they've been analyzed, you know, I'm not the first person to study public sector collective bargaining laws, but um, for the most part, they've been studied uh, in the context of, well, how does this change the cost of schooling? So economists would look at, well, you pass these laws and what do teachers make for a salary or how much is government spending on education? But the the lens that I'm looking at them through is how did they make it easier uh, to mobilize teachers for political advocacy. And I have several arguments about why they did just that. Got it. So, yeah, so there are two separate concepts here. One is, at least as, as far as I see it, one is um, teachers unions use that power to get sort of substantive policy done. And that policy may be favorable to teachers in one way or another, but it wasn't necessarily favorable to the organization. So you might get, for instance, smaller class sizes or certain curricula done, something like that. But uh, what you're talking about is a little bit different. It's about almost like procedure. Teachers unions could um, extract concessions or, or get policies made that would make it uh, more feasible for them to run the union to keep and attract members. Am I, am I tracking? Yeah, that's right. So, so the first thing that you point out, um, is fundamental to, um, collective bargaining and labor unions more generally, which is that we're talking about a bilateral negotiation. And this is really interesting in the public sector because, um, think about the world before, uh, you had public sector collective bargaining in the education space, the school board, uh, obviously subject to state and federal laws, Um, The school board, which represents the school districts and the taxpayers, would set public policy. And uh, teachers and education employees could certainly 
be a part of that decision making process. They could, you know, they could get involved in school board elections. They could make it known which candidates they supported, but they were really on equal footing with any other citizen group in the community. Mm-hmm. I mean, this goes way back to the idea of like uh, the famous political scientist Robert Dahl's book, Who Governs, uh, where he looked at a uh, lot uh, uh, the activity of different citizen groups uh, in New Haven, Connecticut. And his answer was, look, like lots of different people are involved in the process. We have pluralism. But after public sector collective bargaining, uh, you had a legal change that really removed that policymaking process to become a bilateral one where um, I'm not going to get too in the weeds here, but I guess it's pretty simple. It's basically states pass laws that said in short, if 50 percent plus one teacher in a school district make it known that they want to be represented by a union and bargain collectively over their pay, benefits, and working conditions, that then as a matter of law, the school district, the school board has to sit down and hash out an agreement on policy provisions with the teachers union. And suddenly what that means is uh, the only role that the public and other interest groups get to play in uh, collective bargaining is Prior to it, they get to have a, uh, an influence in elections, right? They help pick the school board. But once you have the bargaining process set up and once the school board's chosen, the public r- doesn't get to enter that room. So that's the first big subsidy that the union gets. But the second one, which I spend a lot of time in the book on, is that for a variety of reasons, but we can honestly say in, in some part um, due to s- the desire for a simple system in, in, in the United States – we have labor policy that's predicated on the principle of exclusivity, which means that once that 50 percent of teachers say we want to negotiate, we want to be represented by a union, they get to choose one union and the school board and the district only do business in terms of negotiating with one union. So you could have a case where 51 percent of the teachers say we want to be represented by the NEA affiliate and 49 percent of the teachers say we want to be represented by uh, another union, uh, but all 49% of those teachers are going to have to go along with and be represented by the one chosen, the union chosen by the 51%. Now that matters because as a practical matter, school districts uh, suddenly realize that any communication that they had with all of their teacher employees, uh, anything that they did to influence the employer-employee relationship had to be channeled through that single Union that now had exclusive representation rights. And in a series of court decisions validating uh, the architecture of that labor, that exclusive labor system, federal courts began to hold that benefits that the school district would give to the union. And I'll give some specific examples, but those benefits could only go to that single union interest group. And so, for example, Uh, You know, we don't think a lot today, I think, about uh, snail mail. But back in the 70s when this was all happening, one of the first things that the union would ask for is they'd say, hey, at any time we want to be able to get our message to teachers in the district. So school board, you're going to open up all of the teachers' mailboxes for us and any union literature that we want to distribute to all of the teachers, you're going to do for us. Now, that might seem really small, but in the context of thinking about other groups in the district that might also have a a different viewpoint than the teachers unions, they wouldn't have a way to communicate, say, with all parents or all taxpayers, uh, which would put them at a marked disadvantage in any sort of political or policy fight that was happening in the district. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another good example of this um, uh, is that uh, many uh, teachers unions would be able to get a concession from the school board that their local union president, who would be typically be a teacher, would get to take a leave um, while they were serving as union president, and the local taxpayers in the district would pay their salary. Now, sometimes, of course, that would get paid back by the union, but in certain cases, the district taxpayers actually assumed the responsibility of paying for the union president. Now, that matters because the union president spends maybe a little bit of their time negotiating the collective bargaining agreement. And the union's argument was, well, they're spending their time negotiating the agreement. That's important. But they also spent time deciding which school board candidates the union should endorse or knocking on doors in a state Senate election or something like that. And that was all time on the taxpayer's dime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you use the term subsidy. Um, That's one of the terms that I was unfamiliar with when I was reading the book. I'm not sure that um, this was used in this space before. If it was, I wasn't aware of it. 
Um, but I was attracted to the term. I tried to use it a couple of times with some friends, you know, talking about some of these issues. And they, they said, well, what do you mean? The, what do you mean the government subsidizing the union? They took it very literally as a financial contribution or investment in the union. Um, you're using it a little bit differently to talk about, um, advantages. I guess sometimes, and like in the case of release time that you mentioned, there's actually financial subsidy, but these are other kinds of subsidies. I wonder if you could spend some time talking about the subsidies that they were given um, through the law. And then you, you've talked a, a little bit about the subsidies that were given in collective bargaining. But aside from the exclusivity principle, what are some other subsidies that were offered in state law? Well, the first one's membership. So – um, you know, uh, it's, I think, a staple of any membership organization. Uh, first of all, why do you want to have members? And the reason you want to have members, obviously, part of it is, you know, members pay dues, and that helps uh, allow the organization to uh, be as active as possible, both in the political arena, um, but also sort of in general communications and messaging. Um, uh, and, and so when we think about membership, um, you know, all interest groups, all membership based interest groups have an incentive um, to have more members. And oh, l and let me also mention another another obvious sort of point that was clearly not so obvious to me a, a moment ago uh, is simply the fact that when an interest group goes to sit down and try and lobby or their or their lobbyists go and try and convince a, an elected uh, politician uh, to pursue the policy that, that the association wants. I think they're more persuasive when they have more members, right? This is what we uh, in political science refer to as grassroots lobbying. The reason seniors scare politicians on Social Security is because the AARP can mobilize seniors to call up their member of Congress and say, don't you dare touch that Social Security cost of living increase. Um, and so much uh, – so the same is true for teachers unions, right? If, if a teachers union only represents one out of – say, ten, every 10 teachers in the state, they really can't claim to speak on behalf of teachers. When they represent seven out of 10 teachers, maybe then politicians say, we ought to listen to these folks because they just have to blast out an email uh, and they can get these teachers riled up and know, you know how we're voting on a given issue. So membership's the first thing. And you know, the fundamental challenge for all membership-based interest groups is trying to grow their membership because uh, – you know, members are, are people just like anyone else. They want to pay as little as possible, but get the benefits of membership. And so it's kind of like an iron claw, uh, ironclad law of economics that if you increase the price of membership, you typically see a decrease in the number of people who are willing to be a member of your organization. I mean, think of like the NRA. Uh, if they take membership from uh, dues from $30 to $40, they can predict with laser-like accuracy how many people are going to stop paying those dues. In fact, one of the stories I tell in the book is – uh, just a few years ago, the National Parent Teacher Association tried to raise their dues from something like $1.50 a member to maybe two bucks. And it was rejected uh, at their annual meeting because they were terrified that they were going to lose millions of members over raising uh, dues by a dollar. Well, the teachers unions aren't like that because um, – these public sector collective bargaining laws that were passed in many states, those states certainly that didn't have right to work laws that said folks who didn't want to associate with the union or support it financially in any way, um, they didn't have to provide any support to the union. But in states uh, that had provided for what were called agency fees, the union could turn to teachers who were thinking maybe not of being a member and paying that thousand dollars a year and say, well, yeah, you certainly have a constitutional right not to be a member, but you're still going to have to pay 800 bucks. And by the way, you don't get to vote in any of the union elections. You don't get any of the selective benefits. So like when you take your family to Disney, you don't get the teacher benefit on the car rental. So in other words, it made a really it made it it incentivized people to become members of unions. Uh, and that's like a great example. And so in California, I talk about in the book, um, when Governor Schwarzenegger was governor, he proposed several ballot measures that the teachers unions opposed. And the California Teachers Association said, oh, well, we'll, we'll beat this back. We're going to raise every member's dues $60, which is a huge spike. And, you know, you would have predicted that tons of people would have left the union. But in fact, just the opposite happened. They actually grew membership because the CTA could turn to all those members and say, hey, like you're still going to pay an agency fee. So get on board uh, or pay up anyway. Um, now, uh, just for, for the record, obviously, you know this, but so all listeners know this. This change, of course, with the Supreme Court's Janus decision 
in 2018. So that's no longer the case. But it explains why from, say, 1960 to 2018, the unions were among the only interest groups out there, uh, occupational-based interest groups, that were able to grow their membership. So I contrast in the book, say, uh, teachers with physicians and attorneys. The American Bar Association and the American Medical Association have absolutely struggled in the last 40 years to keep doctors and lawyers paying their dues to these organizations. And so membership has fallen and or those groups have had to lower their membership costs. And the teachers unions steadily have been able to increase revenue because up until before Janus, they were able to count at least in 22 states on um, an incentive in state law to keep those members in the fold. So I think that's the most important one. Yeah. Okay. so we've talked a little bit about some of the the subsidies that make running the union easier. Um, they, so something you called in the book policy feedback, which I don't think you invented that word, but that was also new to me, policy feedback so that, um, the, the subsidies make it easier to run the union. Uh, the union feels more encouraged and more emboldened to affect public policy and that public policy in turn, again, makes it easier to run the union. Um, I, I, I guess part of what I'm interested in, though, see, almost seems like it's outside of this because unions also have the ability to affect, um, as, as we've touched on, elections themselves so that the people with whom they're dealing in the government, they've essentially selected or at least they've endorsed or communicated with during the, during the race. How, how, do, how do unions involve themselves in, in elections beyond just the, the money side? Uh, well, the biggest thing is mobilizing their members and people say, well, you know, I mean, how could that really make much of a difference? You know, can 300 teachers in a district really turn a school board election? Well, possibly. But remember, uh, oftentimes they have a spouse. Oftentimes they have, uh, you know, other relatives that still live close by. Um, and so you can multiply the votes by two, three. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these local races are decided by small margins. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, this is one of the things that that oftentimes gets overlooked um, because people will say, well, you know, how powerful are public sector unions when you look at, at the federal level at all these other huge interest groups and billionaires and this sort of thing. But remember, public sector unions don't really have to have a lot of influence at the federal level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, at least in education, it's state and school board politics that make the difference. Now, at the school board election, I already mentioned the unions are you, you ask, you know, this isn't me saying this. Survey after survey asking school board members over the last 20 years, every survey that's ever been done, uh, asking school board members to evaluate how active and influential different groups are in their districts, teachers, teachers and their unions come out number one every time. Occasionally, they might say parents get close, but, you know, um, school board members themselves say this is the most influential actor. Now, at the state level, it's fair to say that the unions do face a little bit more competition. But even there, you have to keep in mind that the unions are really, for the most part, focused on one issue, and that is ed policy. Whereas other like business interest groups in a state, sure, they may go head to head on the union over tax rates, right? And that might matter to the union. But on something obscure, like how are we going to evaluate teachers or should we reconsider teacher tenure, those sorts of things, the business community is not year in and year out getting excited about those things. They're not, you know, they're not strategically saying we're going to donate money or we're going to make phone calls to the folks that sit on the K-12 education subcommittee. Um, but the teachers union is going to do that. And so mm -hmm. it's, they don't have to be the biggest elephant in the room in all of politics. They just have to be the biggest elephant in the room when it comes to their issues in some of these smaller bore political arenas. And that's not particularly a high bar for them to get to, which is why people say, well, you know, like, look at states where teachers unions don't have as many, you know, uh, rights under government. And well, why aren't they doing, you know, why aren't those states just doing much better than the other states? Because the unions aren't really weak when it comes to that sort of inside baseball anywhere, right? You don't mm -hmm. have to be California. Uh, you don't have to spend California dollars when you're in Montana. You just have to get enough a support on, say, an education committee in the legislature to block something that you don't want from happening. Well, and I imagine that's true of not, you know, teachers unions and ed policy or perhaps some other issues that might touch on it. But you've got other public sector unions 
that are concerned about other kinds of issues, non, non-ed related. And so you may have this kind of thing happening. I, I remember when I worked in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, um, I had an office uh, right across from the Capitol and you could see buses pull up and people with different colored shirts, depending on the union, spill out of those buses, grab a lunch usually on their way out. And um, they had all been bussed out. If you, if you go and talk to them, they're pretty honest. They've been bussed out from somewhere like Philadelphia or Allentown or Reading, and, and they're not entirely sure what they're there for, but they're there to speak for the union and for the rights of workers. Um, they've, in fact, probably been let out of work on union release or something in order to do that. But the regardless of how they got there, the shirts and the sheer numbers end up at it's a pretty impressive sight. I mean, sometimes when you go in the Capitol, you'll see nothing but purple shirts. And I, I would imagine that that's influential just just by sheer volume and and uniformity. Well, one of the things that I actually gathered some data on in the book was I took the opportunity. I was um, this book grew out of my dissertation, which so this is something that I started, you know, back in 2009. So it just so happened uh, that I was uh, in the middle of writing when the recall election uh, that the union undertook in Wisconsin to try to unseat Scott Walker when he had uh, enacted Act 10, which had radically restructured uh, some of the, the rights for unions there. So I took that opportunity to survey teachers in the state and uh, about 5,000 teachers responded to my survey. And one of the things that I was able to tease out of that survey, which is directly uh, related to what you're talking about in terms of the influence of the rank and file uh, in state politics is I did a little experiment where I presented all of these teachers with hypothetical candidates who were running for a state Senate seat. And one of the things that I did was um, I basically varied the position of this candidate uh, on issues that mattered to teachers. So it was like teacher merit pay and teacher tenure, whether the candidate took the union's position on those issues or took the reform position on those issues. And what was really interesting was I I found that teachers really do vote the education issues. So in other Mm -hmm. words, teachers who told me they were a strong, you know, uh, through and through Democrat uh, would abandon a state Senate candidate who was a Democrat that was going to go against their occupational interests and and vice versa. The Republicans would say no thanks to the Republican candidate if they weren't going to stand behind teacher tenure. So, you you know, it was really interesting. It was like people who told me that they were pro-choice on abortion would vote for the pro-life candidate if they took the right position on the union issue. And I think what that tells us is that teachers – are unique in that they will vote their occupational interests, which Mm. means that if you're a state legislature or a candidate, you're going to think twice about abandoning the teacher position because I'm not convinced that other voters are going to do the same thing. They're not necessarily going to put teacher tenure at the center of their political universe, which is why if you look at polls, 70 percent of the public says, I don't think teachers should have a job for life or I think teachers should be paid based on their performance. That's hugely popular, but it doesn't mean that most voters are going to make that the defining issue on how they vote. But for teachers, they'll do that. Right. Okay. Well, some maybe this is I see it as related, but um, I remember you seeing some work that you had done. I think it was for Manhattan Institute with um, that looked at the impact of union endorsements. So here you're talking about individual teachers looking at candidates. Sometimes I I would imagine union endorsement might matter even more for those teachers as a signal, but they matter not just to the teachers, but, but as I, as I recall you saying uh, that they matter really to the general public, they could decide an election, at least at the school board level. Can you, can you tell us about that research? Yeah. So, you know, the first half of my career, uh, you know, I sort of subscribe to the notion that most of the union advantage was due to their mobilization of their own members. Now, I think that's true. That makes a difference. Uh, but when you look at some of the gaps, like I'm saying, 70 percent of candidates that get that union not are winning. Uh, you know, um, a colleague pointed out to me, he's like, well, you know, I don't think it's just the teachers that are running up those sort of margins. I think there's something else going on here. So we started to look at this from the perspective of maybe that union endorsement is interpreted by 
by ordinary voters uh, in a positive way. They use it as a cue for thinking something uh, that they like about the candidates that get the union endorsement. But when we dug a little deeper and we used various survey experiments where we would ask, the, you know, we'd present hypothetical candidates to the public. Uh, sometimes we'd say this candidate got the union endorsement. Sometimes the same candidate didn't. And we stepped back and we saw, yes, this is true. The average member of the public does provide uh, – uh, uh, does feel more warmly to and more enthusiastic about supporting a candidate that they're told was endorsed by the union. Um, but what was interesting about that was it wasn't just the case that people um, – that citizens who said they liked unions uh, were the ones that were uh, seeing that as a positive cue. It was basically everyone, including Republicans. Uh, and so this sort of stumped us um, until we sort of thought more about it. We said, well, maybe what's going on here is that voters – uh, because they trust teachers, kind of right where we started off today, they trust teachers and they 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 think maybe that this is a this is a signal that this is the teacher favored candidate. Um, so they just feel more warmly toward them. So we, we you know, asked everybody on the survey, we said, look, um, uh, do you which of the two candidates, the union endorsed one or the non-union endorsed one, do you think is more likely to raise teacher salaries? And they all said, you know, the union endorsed candidate. So that's not surprising. But we also asked them which of these candidates is going to be more likely to stand up for parents' rights and parents' advocacy and be more responsive to parents. And they also said the union. Mm -hmm. And then we asked them, well, which of these candidates is going to focus more on student achievement than anything else? Once again, they said the union. So we sort of walked away saying, OK, that's how voters are interpreting the union endorsement. Remember, a lot of times in districts, the um, – the union is not called the union. It's called the such and such education association. Um, and mm. we didn't find that that made a, much of a big difference. But I still think that a lot of times voters uh, aren't used to seeing union. They don't think about it as a union. They think about it more as a, as a group that represents teachers. But here's where things are interesting. Voters interpret these endorsements in a favorable light, which helps union back candidates. And they do so because they think that on all dimensions, the union endorsed candidate is superior. But the final step of that research that we did, we looked at uh, how unions render their own endorsement decisions. Do they render them in a way that aligns with the way the public interprets them? And here's where things got interesting. Uh, we looked, for example, uh, and I like to put it this way. We, we looked to see whether unions use the old Ronald Reagan uh, quip during the 1980 election when he said to people, well, um, are you better off than you were four years ago? In the context of school districts, I think most of us would say, are the kids better off than they were four years ago? So we looked very specifically at did student achievement improve uh, from the time that a school board member got on the board to four years later? And what we found was that when teachers decided whether to support an incumbent school board candidate for reelection, they made no distinction. That is, we couldn't find any relationship between how well the kids were improving and whether the union supported the incumbent. But we did find a strong relationship between the likelihood that the union got behind a school board member's reelection campaign and whether the school board had given a large salary increase to senior teachers the year going into the election. Uh, and so you say that's not particularly surprising, but it's important because it suggests that voters are misinterpreting what the union endorsement means. Now, if voters, if all they wanted them to do is raise teacher salaries, then they're doing the right thing in supporting the union back in it. But since voters said the union endorsed candidates are focusing on student achievement and parent rights, that's not what they're doing when they're issuing these endorsements. Um, the the. Over the last few years, we've seen a decline in, in union membership and, and even with teachers unions, a lot of teachers have left the union. It, some of this decline even predates that Janus decision so that um, we can't attribute it all to to the fact that they don't have to pay the, the union if they don't want to. Um, last year, however, the, the union raised dues. And I assume they're trying to make it up for a budget shortfall, um, even though they're still making pretty good money and have a ton of money in reserves. Um, what's the future here? Are we looking at a steady decline of teachers unions? You know, are, are, are they going to be less powerful going forward? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I have thoughts. This is not so much scholarship. This is a really tough thing to study. Um, and, uh, you know, there are, the unions, I would say right now, are behaving in a way that doesn't make a lot of uh, 
uh, strategic sense to me, um, but I can tell a story where maybe it makes strategic sense to them. And that is if anyone caught the NEA president, Becky Pringle's speech at the last annual convention, I mean, people are saying like she was breathing fire, right? It wasn't, this was not sort of a kumbaya, we're going to focus on raising teacher salaries, kind of like big tent issues. It was, she was going all in culture war on the left. If we could say, you know, she was basically giving the moms for Liberty version, but on the other side on these issues, and, you know, that makes no sense to me. And here's why. Because post Janus, teachers unions need to actually compete for members who are more conservative than the union. So common sense would sort of suggest that they would, if not moderate, emphasize bread and butter issues like school safety, teacher pay, pensions, you know, things that – Teachers care about just occupationally, not the more sort of partisan uh, laden issues. So that tells me something. I think what it means is that the unions are focusing uh, more on kind of their true believers. Uh, They're saying, well, maybe we can't keep the moderate person sending dues, but maybe we can double our donation from the more extreme person. Um, I think that's actually something we've seen in some ways um, in the broader constellation of interest groups in American politics. If you think of – I like to use these three interest groups um, in comparing and contrasting the ACLU, the National Rifle Association, and the Teachers Union. And what's sort of interesting is all three of these unions – or not unions, all three of these interest groups – I would say used to be what we would kind of call single issue interest groups. Teachers unions would focus on education issues that teachers care about. The NRA would focus on guns and the ACLU would focus on speech and civil libertarian issues. But over time, I think it's fair to say the NRA, you know, they show up at CPAC. They're kind of just another interest group on the right. They tend to overwhelmingly only endorse Republicans. And then we can say the ACLU, with some exceptions, gets a lot more excited about free speech cases that are defending folks on the left than maybe defending, you know, conservative professors. Um, And I think that's just kind of where our politics are at right now, that the financial incentives are to kind of like go all in with the most extreme version of your side. And we've really seen the withering away of if Madison talked about the mischief of factions, these factions are less likely to be single issue factions. And they're more likely just to be part of this left right interest group divide. Yeah. Okay. Well, that that uh, that comports with a lot of what what we see out there today. Um, well, thanks. Uh, thank you, Michael, for joining us. I appreciate your your time and um, really enjoyed the book, uh, How Policies Make Interest Groups. Um, thanks again, Michael. Thanks, David. Great to be with you. And that's a wrap for today's episode of Disunion, the Government Union Report. We hope you found today's exploration into public sector labor policy both insightful and thought provoking. Special thanks to all of you for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's discussion and want to stay informed about the latest developments, don't forget to subscribe to Disunion, the Government Union Report, on Spotify or your favorite podcast platform. Your support means the world to us. I'm David R. Osborne, reminding you that understanding labor policy is crucial for shaping the future. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and keep making a difference.